So where we are today is in 1 Corinthians 15, um, uh, the longest chapter that Paul wrote. And we are about midway there, uh, midway through, so to speak. So um, maybe a little less than midway, but um, we're going to continue on there. Last week, we ended with verses 21 and 22. I'm going to start there this week and say a, a couple of brief things about that. And then probably... Um, we're going to break down, hopefully, um, it, it has a nice flow to it as we move on with verses 23 and following. So hopefully, we'll be able to flow through some of the commentary on those scriptures. But last week, when we ended, we were at verses 21 and 22. So if you will turn with me in your Bible to 1 Corinthians 15. If you want to follow along in the commentary, it's page 155. And I'm going to read verses 21 and 22. Um, now, remember, chapter 15, Paul is proving the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that without the resurrection, really, we have no hope. We have no reason for doing what we're doing if the resurrection of Christ was not the truth. And um, back up in the verse 12, he says to the Corinthians, now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? So that gives us evidence there that there were some among them that were speaking that there was no resurrection. So he says, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? So Paul spends a, an extensive amount of time Proving the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's, it's our very hope. It's why we do what we do. It's why Paul suffered what he suffered and continues to pin the word of God to its completion because the resurrection brings us that hope in which we live. So that's the purpose or part of the purpose of, of chapter 15. And that's where we are. And he says this in verse 21, 21 and 22. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Now, when we ask ourselves the question, when we're talking to people, are they in Adam or are they in Christ? That's where that kind of comes from. For in Adam all die. Even so, in Christ shall all be made alive. So what puts us in Christ is to believe the gospel uh, of Christ, which we are given there in verses 3 and 4 in this very chapter. But the verses 21 and 22 show that, that as people, mankind, we are two people. We are Adam or we are Christ. Because we all have a sin nature thanks to Adam, basically before we believe the gospel, we are all in Adam uh, and we are definitely in Adam when we are born. Once we recognize our sin and trust in Jesus's death, burial, and resurrection, which is the gospel as atonement for our sin, we are taken out of Adam and placed into Christ. Now, once that happens, we're always in Christ. No matter what our flesh motivates us to do or, or whatever, the flesh is always um, present with the sin nature. So it cannot please God. But once we believe the gospel, we are then moved from being in a place of death in Adam to being in a place of life in Christ. And that is never taken away from us. That's a very difficult concept for a lot of people. It was for me because I was so motivated by performance. I thought that once I was saved, my flesh then got changed somehow and could be pleasing to God. It wasn't until I really understood the scriptures on that that I, I realized when Paul penned Romans 7, 18, and he says that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. That's even after we are saved. Our flesh is never put into alignment, so to speak, with, with Christ. Our flesh is always vile until the rapture of the church. Our flesh will always be vile. So, um, but once we are believing in the gospel, we are taken out of that place of death, out of Adam and placed into Christ. And since Christ actually rose from the dead, the resurrection, 
We also have risen from the dead once we believe the gospel. And we have to, to use, we can use supporting scripture to say, yes, we are risen. We are quickened. Uh, we are made alive in Christ. Ye are dead, the scripture says in Colossians chapter three. Ye are dead and your life is now hid with Christ in God. So the life that, it, Galatians 2.20, the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So our life is Christ. And that's something that we can learn as we read and, and believe the epistles of Paul. We can understand more fully what that means as we go along. And it's because we are baptized into Jesus Christ's death. Um, that's in Romans 6 verse 3. Now, that baptism is not a water baptism there. It is a spirit baptism because we are identified with Christ's death. And that's what baptism does. It identifies us with Christ's death. We are also then identified with Christ's resurrection. And this means what we just mentioned, that our life is now hid with Christ in God. And we are, as Ephesians 1, 6 tells us, that we are accepted in the beloved. I have a friend who is going through, well, she's, she's been diagnosed in the, in this, I think she's a little bit past the first stages, but she's been diagnosed with dementia, Alzheimer's type, and she's doing everything that she possibly can to, um, not progress that in her life. Like, uh, one of the things that she read about that is good for you is to exercise because it it unlocks some things within our metabolism and within our chemistry that feed the brain in a good way. So if you ever have want to have a reason to exercise, maybe that could be it. Well, my, maybe it would help, you know, hold off that dementia or whatever. But something that she wanted to know, what can I do? She asked me, what can I do? to help myself during this season of my life. And I said, one of the things that we can do is we can affirm every day who we are in Christ. And I said, you need to say those things out loud every day. And these are two scriptures that I gave to her, Colossians 3, 3, uh, ye are dead and your life is now hid with Christ in God and Ephesians 1, 6, where it tells us that we are accepted in the beloved. So I think that those are, are, to me, to finally grasp what that means to my life um, was so freeing because it, it, it's already happened. My life is already hid with Christ in God. I am already accepted in the beloved. So God has to give us eternal life in heaven. If God sends us to an eternal hell, then he would have to send Christ to eternal hell also. And I brought up last um, last Thursday night, I had some guests here and it was their first Bible study to sit through that was rightly divided. And so afterward we were talking and I brought up the very scripture that Eric points out here, 2 Timothy 2, 13. If we believe not, then he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. So he cannot deny us eternal life because he cannot deny Christ. Now that gives us reason that we should rejoice evermore. We talked about that scripture last week, rejoice evermore. And that, that fact right there should give us reason to do that. So this is also why it's so important when we start putting these pieces together. For me, it was aha moments. You know, it was like, oh my goodness, these pieces started fitting together. It's why Paul in the beginning of Romans started talking about the validity of Christ being fully man and fully God. So Christ had to be fully man in addition to being fully God. Being fully God meant that he would never sin. So what does that mean for us? That means that Christ in us never sins. So when I, when I act out upon my flesh, that's the flesh. It's not Christ in me. Christ in me never sins. That's a sobering thought right there. Being fully man meant that he could be the propitiation or that kinsman redeemer, fully satisfying sacrifice for our sins. 
The reason is given in verse 21 here in 1 Corinthians 15. Um, since death came by one man, only man could bring about the resurrection of the dead. And that man who did so was Christ. So when we talk about Christ having to have faith uh, in what God told him, it's that right there. Christ as man had to have faith that he would be resurrected. He had to have that faith. A lot of times we don't think about that. And many times churchianity just simultaneously uh, puts Christ as God and not puts him as, put him as man. So we, to understand the scriptures, we need to understand that he is fully God, but he is also fully man. That is the only thing that makes him um, qualified to be our redeemer. Our kinsman redeemer is that. So we should also note that verse 22, and I mentioned this last week when it says, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive, that that's not a, a, um, a, a stepping stone to teach universal salvation. It does not mean that all are made alive by Christ's death, burial, and resurrection such that all go to heaven. And there is that belief that we're all God's children. We're all going to go to heaven, no matter what you've believed, no matter what you, what you subscribe to in your, in your life, you're, you're going to go to heaven. That's just not the truth. Rather, it means that those that are in Christ, those that have been moved from Adam to Christ, they are made alive. They are the ones who are going to be in heaven. So you're only in Christ if you believe the gospel and when you believe the gospel. So those who do not believe the gospel are still in Adam. And so they end up in the lake of fire. So that brings us to where we stopped last week. So we're going to read verses 23 and 24. I said I wanted to stop there last week, a little shy of our uh, on our time together, because I wanted us to get what's coming next. And I, I didn't want to, I knew that we would, would not have enough time to kind of go into it. But let's read verses 23 and 24. Verse 23, but every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ's at his coming, then cometh the end when, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. So, Verse 23 may make you think that the rapture and Jesus' second coming are the same event. When I, Where I grew up, we weren't taught a rapture at all. We were taught that it is appointed unto man first to die and then face the judgment. So it was basically, there was, at your physical death, that was your judgment. We were not taught about the, the the judgment seat of Christ versus the great white throne judgment. And so I never was exposed to that. I, I really never had that exposure, had the exposure to the rapture uh, in Louisiana before right division, but the rest, I did not have that exposure until coming in to right division. So when we first read verse 23, uh, but every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward, they that are Christ that is coming, we may think sometimes that the rapture and Jesus' second coming are the same event, and they are not. But Paul says that Christ rose from the dead first, then all those in Christ are raised at Christ's coming. Then, verse 24, then cometh the end. However, Paul is not giving right here a detailed account of the end time events. Rather, he is proving the resurrection. Remember what we said, that this chapter is important. Number one, it gives us the gospel in verses three and four, and it proves the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which without that, we have no hope. Without the resurrection, we have no hope. So what he is saying here in these two verses is the whole reason that Christ came to earth as a man the whole reason he lived a perfect life, the whole reason he took our sin upon himself was so that he, he could conquer death for us. Now, shy of the rapture, we are all going to face that day, that physical death. Spiritually speaking, 
we will never face that. But physically speaking, we will all face that shy of the rapture. Christ's resurrection from the dead shows that he is the first fruits or the first one to be raised to eternal life in a glorified body. He is the first one. Now, once we believe the gospel, we are moved from Adam, we are placed into Christ, and we then belong to Christ. He purchased us with his own blood. And he didn't only purchase us, you and I, the church, the body of Christ with his own blood. If we turn back to Acts 20, real quickly, Acts 20, verse 28, it says this. Um, Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Christ didn't just purchase us with his blood. All who believe in him have been purchased with the blood of Christ. So it does not matter if we are a part of Israel's dispensation or part of the grace dispensation. Either way, all people who believe the gospel presented to them have been bought with the price of Christ's blood. Now, I will honestly say, and we belong to him, and I will honestly say that before fully understanding the gravity of that, I, it was just something I read. But when it took root within my life, then I, I realized what it really means. Do, you, do we even realize what has been done for us by Christ? It's an incredible thing. He has purchased us with his blood so that he could conquer death for us. We don't have to taste that because he did it for us. Therefore, when Jesus comes back at the rapture, he will raise us up at the grave. Then when he comes back for Israel, after the tribulation period is over, they will rise up from their graves. So here in the text of scripture, explaining those dispensational distinctions is not pertinent to what Paul is discussing here. So, which is the resurrection. Since all believers belong to Christ and will be all be raised by Christ in the future. So he lumps both the rapture and the second coming into one in that scripture based on what he's teaching at that moment. So we don't need to be confused or, or start thinking that all of that is one simultaneous event, the rapture, the second coming, and the end. All of that is not happening, boom, at one time. When we have all been resurrected, who will be resurrected, that is the end. And Christ then will deliver up the kingdom to God, the Father. And that's what it's talking about there in verse 24. Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. So when God made the world, God gave dominion of his creation to man. Adam gave it over to Satan when man sinned. Since death came by man, life also has to come by man. We just read that in verse 21. Therefore, Christ took our sin upon him so that he could fight against death to win the dominion of the world back um, from Satan and not just the world. We know that Jesus conquered death and because his righteousness kept death from having power over him, therefore Jesus emerged from hell, having the keys of hell and death. But not only does he reconcile the heavens back, he reconciles the earth back. So he reconciles both dominions, if you will, both spheres, if you will. So that brings us, I'm going to reread verse 24, and I'm going to take us a little further. I'm going to take us down to verse 26. So verse 24 again, then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God, even the father, uh, when he shall put, put, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. Verse 26, 
the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. So God is the possessor of heaven and earth. And it's interesting that, that that's pinned right there in our text because I was telling the ladies before we got started that there was a book that uh, Nancy, who couldn't be on today, but she showed us, um, and I picked, I, I ordered it from Forgotten Truths, and it's called Satan and His Plan of Evil. Satan and His Plan of Evil. And in the beginnings of this book, which, you know, I'm only in the beginnings, he talks about the, the end game of Satan there is to become like the Most High. I will be like the Most High, is what he says in Isaiah, or the, the, the words of his heart, basically. Matter of fact, let me read it to you just as it says, because that's important. Um, Isaiah 14, 12 through 14 says this, and I didn't realize I was going to put this in here, but it kind of fits, so I'm going to put it. Um, Isaiah 14, 12 through 14. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. That is the plan of Satan. That's it right there. And when he says, I will be like the most high, the most high, that is a reference to, to God being the possessor of heaven and earth. That's what Satan wants to do. If he can get people to believe that there is no resurrection, if he can take the mindset from things above and put them on things on the earth, he can try to win the hearts and the minds of those who have not believed the gospel yet by false gospel. And he believes he can become the possessor of heaven and earth. Well, we know the end of the story. We know the middle of the story and we know the beginning of the story. We know that that's not going to happen. So when we read these verses here, Eric pins in our commentary for us, God is the possessor of heaven and earth. As the possessor of heaven and earth, God gave dominion of the earth to Adam. Now, when Adam sinned, Satan usurped his authority, making Satan the God of this world. We're taught, we, we talk about that in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, where Satan, the little G, he is the little G God of this world. God knew that the second Adam, which is Christ, would get the rule of the earth and heaven, for that matter, back from Satan. So therefore, in eternity, man will rule over heaven and earth. Ephesians 1.10 says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on, uh, and which are on earth, even in him. God must wait. We talk about long suffering. You think about us being long suffering with what we have to deal with in this life. Think about God being long suffering. He has to wait until all things are gathered into Christ before man, Christ, can rule over everything again. You know, there are people, and, and my sister and I talk about this, she has a hard time reconciling. Why doesn't God just, once you're saved, that's the end of it for you, and you just go to heaven and be done with all this? But I said, he can't do that. I said, if he did that, there would be no more uh, hope for people to believe the gospel because there would be no gospel presented because people who believe the gospel then would be in heaven. There would be no one here as the voice of the gospel on earth. So he can't do that. Satan is an evil ruler. You know, the word Satan means adversary. So he is an adversary against God. God the Father has to reign over everything right now. Granted, Jesus has destroyed death. However, death is not swallowed up in victory until this corruptible 
shall put on incorruption. And we'll get to that verse later on in this chapter. So in other words, death is not swallowed up in victory for those who are in Christ until they receive their glorified bodies. Remember me telling you, as long as we're in this state, our physical body is going to taste that physical death. That death, that particular part is not swallowed up in victory until our body is raised and our soul and spirit rejoin in that glorified state. That's that's when this corruptible, corruptible shall put on incorruption. That is when that glorified body will be present. That is when death is swallowed up in victory. So it's not going to happen until we receive our glorified bodies. So the enemy of death has not been destroyed yet. Death has no power over believers' lives, but all believers will still die, provided the rapture does not take place in their lifetimes. Now, we always think, and, and when you look at um, in generations that have gone, they always think that they are the terminal generation because you always hear stories about, well, how can things get worse? I just can't picture God letting things keep going down this downward spiral. We are surely the, 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 the last terminal generation. We are the ones that are going to be raptured. We don't know that for sure. The generations before us certainly weren't the ones to be raptured. We may not be either. But what we do know is we are nearing the fulfilling of, of this dispensation based on things that we see, based on things that we read and believe. But yet we must remember that God himself is in charge of that. So we don't know. But once that happens, death will be swallowed up in victory. But since death has not been swallowed up in victory yet, God the Father must continue to reign. However, once death has been destroyed, all believers in both dispensations will be reconciled to Christ. Therefore, the end has come. Christ can then deliver up the kingdom to his Father with all enemies now being under Christ's feet. So what he said here in verse 25 for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. So it won't be until that time that all enemies will be placed under Christ's feet. So in other words, God the Father gave dominion of his kingdom to man first, Adam. Man allowed Satan to usurp that rule. God sends another man, Jesus. Remember Jesus, fully man, fully God. And he gets the rule back from Satan. That's still in process. We have to remember that. That's still happening. He then delivers the kingdom to the Father, since the Father has had to rule in the meantime, since Satan is the little G God of this world and not man. This is why we see Satan having to report to God in Job 1 and 2, for example, when Satan goes up before God. Um then uh, the father then examines the kingdom and determines that all rule and all authority and power have been put down by Christ. He then gives the kingdom back to Christ for him to rule over as fully man, since Christ will rule completely according to the father's plan. Then all those in Christ will rule with him for all eternity. Now that's a mouthful. What we just shared from this commentary is a mouthful. And sometimes it's very difficult, especially when we're first crossing over into these scriptures, rightly dividing the word of truth. To understand it probably doesn't happen the first time we read it. We have to really read it. We have to rely on that teacher, that indwelling Holy Spirit to teach us and discern those things to us. And as he does that, that's the aha. When we get those aha moments over something we've read a thousand times in a thousand different situations and a thousand different scenarios, but then when it finally connects and we make that connection, that's like, oh my goodness, mind blowing. It reminds me of the, 
the emo I have a, another friend who got diagnosed with the flu yesterday and she said her headache was so bad she just felt like her head was going to explode and she sent me that little emoji where it had the the top of the head off and like exploding and um that's what that reminds me of when we finally grasp it it is mind blowing to us that we have a god who from the beginning of his plan, saw the end of it. From the beginning of his plan, he knew that his plan was going to encompass that every man be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. And that that would happen differently for all of us. When we finally get that, that is mind blowing. So let's move forward. Verse 26, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Death is not swallowed up in victory until the rapture of the church, until we receive our glorified body. So verse 27 and 28, for he hath put all things under his feet, but when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted which did put all things under him. Verse 28, and when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Now let's talk about those two scriptures because that verse 27 can also be a little bit confusing. So we get a footnote, basically, as it were, that just because all things are put under Christ's feet, it does not mean that God the Father is subject to him. Rather, the Father is accepted from being under the rule of Christ as the Father continues to be over the Son for all eternity. We need to get that. Therefore, the Son remains subject to the Father. If we don't get that, we'll misunderstand possibly what that's talking about. Now, once this takes place, God is all in all. As the scripture says there um, at the end of verse 28, that God may be all in all. So um, the writer of Hebrews adds some information for us that is parallel basically to what Paul is giving here. He says um, in Hebrews 2, verses 8 and 9, but now we see not yet all things put under him, but we see Jesus crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. That's Hebrews 2, 8 and 9. So in other words, Jesus receives the position of authority over God's kingdom from the Father because he has tasted death for every man. This is why he is sitting at the right hand of the Father and is both Lord and Christ. However, he cannot exercise that power until death has been fully defeated at the time that we receive our glorified bodies. But Christ did exercise his power as Lord and Christ by standing at the right hand of God and putting Israel's program on hold and starting the dispensation of grace, which is where we live. Last week when I had, uh, Thursday evening when I had my friends over here, that was a big distinction right there. We came from a, a time and a mindset that, yes, we are told to rightly divide the word of truth, but we thought that the word came to us rightly divided already. We have the Old Testament and we have the New Testament. We did not realize that there were other divisions. It wasn't even talking about the Old Testament, the New Testament. To rightly divide means to cut straight the information that we have and put it where it belongs. And that when we finally realize that, we understand the time past, the but now and the ages to come. And that those three basic divisions everything can kind of fall into those categories. So um, when the dispensation of grace started, Israel's program was put on hold. That was then the time passed, although it will resurface in the ages to come. And I, I tried to go through the, the pamphlet, that um, the rightly divided pamphlet with the, the chart in there. 
to, to explain that to them. And I had, I have to order some more, but I had two of them. So I gave them two of them. Um, and there were three people. So I have to get another one for them. But anyway, when, when Christ, um, basically Christ did exercise his power as Lord and Christ by standing at the right hand of God and putting Israel's program on hold and starting the dispensation of grace, which is but now where we live. So on earth, Jesus asked for one more year in Israel's program to, uh, to continue because the father was Lord at that time. And that story is told in Luke 13 verses six through nine where Jesus asked for one more year that, that it be tended and fertilized, basically. However, when Jesus rose from the dead, the Father made him Lord. Therefore, Jesus himself could stand at the right hand of the Father and put Israel's program on hold and start the dispensation of grace with Paul in Acts 9. So when that happens, that was another big thing for them Thursday night, was that event right there to understand the setting aside of Israel um, in this moment. That's that's a, a big distinction there. Jesus was touched, Hebrews 4.15 says, with the feeling of our infirmities because he understands that the temptation to sin for man is great. Remember, I can be saved, but nothing changes in my flesh. I still have the vile flesh. Uh, therefore, uh, Christ asked for a one-year grace period for Israel's program because he understands, he understood the temptation to sin for man, for man is great. But after he went into hell and suffered for our sin, that that that's an aha too when we realize what Jesus actually did. And when he went into hell, and suffered for our sin, he fully knew the consequence of sin. This meant that he now had the wisdom to make decisions as the Lord. So it is from this position that he makes the dispensational uh, change once that one-year grace period for Israel was over. And they still did not believe. Israel still did not believe. Yet we still see God's grace in that the Holy Ghost through Stephen said in Acts 7, 60, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Meaning that the Jews could still be saved from the, uh, in the mystery dispensation that started with Paul in Acts 9. So even at the stoning of Stephen, even when that, that Israel's program was being set aside, Stephen says, lay not this sin to their charge. That's that's a big deal. Um, I have written here some notes and I'm not sure. Um, I might have I might have missed it's uh, two pages. <laughs> I might have totally missed sharing that, but we'll see if it fits in in a little bit. So let's move on. Verse 29, first Corinthians 15, verse 29. So this is an interesting scripture right here. Verse 29, else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? If the dead rise not at all, why are they then baptized for the dead? Now there's some terminology there that we need to catch. And I think as we unfold it a little bit, we will catch it, but I'll try to point it out also. Now the group and, and Eric writes about it, but the group that I first think of when I think about people being baptized for the dead is the Mormon, the Mormon church. Years and years ago, uh, Ronnie and I went on a vacation and actually this was like in 2002. It was when the Olympics were going to Salt Lake city and we went for our anniversary. So it, our anniversary is in January. So they were preparing for the uh, winter Olympics that were going to be in Salt Lake city. And we went to that area. Well, while we were there, we went to the Mormon uh, museum. They have in this Mormon area, it's very thick with Mormon population, but they have anything that you want to, to know about them, you can pretty much know except the sacred place. 
You can't go into the, the holy of holies place in the, at the Mormon complex or compound. But when we were in this um, museum, let me just tell you, they had people stationed at different places in this museum to give you very convincing material and information that the Mormon church is the church. But I'll never forget when we came to the place in that museum where it showed this big, huge baptismal pool and very ornate, uh, I mean, very ornate. And that was the pool that people were baptized for the dead. So when Paul says here, and, and, and Eric gets really into it in this commentary, but when he says here, else what shall they do, which are not baptized for the dead, if the dead rise not at all? Why are they then baptized for the dead? So remember the purpose of this chapter, to talk about the resurrection, the rising from the dead. Well, if you don't believe that there is a resurrection, why are you being baptized for the dead? if you don't think there is a resurrection. So the Mormons, Eric says, we're on page 158, the Mormons make a big deal out of this verse. Matter of fact, they really hang their hat on it. This verse is why they spend so much time with genealogy. Now, when we went in 2002, we had always been told, if you want to know anything about yourself or your family, the Mormons, they're the ones to go to because they have all this genealogy about everybody. And they spend a lot of time on genealogy. They say that a good Mormon can research his family tree and then he can be baptized for a dead relative. And when we saw that pool, that, that replica of that baptismal pool, it's unbelievable. It is unbelievable. And they believe that you can be baptized for a dead relative who was not a good Mormon. You, the good Mormon, would be baptized for the one that died not so good Mormon. In so doing, the dead relative can now move up. It's like a, um, a status. They can move up in the afterlife to a higher level of existence. Of course, that is not what this verse is saying, but that's what they believe. And when I read this verse, that's the first group of people that came to my mind was them that do that. So first, we know that water baptism is not recognized by God today. Paul says uh, in verse, uh, in first, that's what this is. <laughs> uh, baptism that is recognized today is spirit baptism. Paul says in first Corinthians 1, 17, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Now, if Paul, Christ sent Paul not to baptize, what benefit is it going to be for me, you, or anybody else to be baptized for someone who is dead? Absolutely nothing. So what that scripture tells us and shows us is that water baptism is not part of the gospel. And the reason is because once you believe, you're moved from Adam to Christ. But once you are uh, believe, um, the moment you believe, the Spirit of God baptizes you into the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And that's Romans 6, verses 3 and 4. It says this, now many places will interpret this to be water baptism. That is not what this is talking about. This is talking about spiritual baptism. Romans 6, 3 and 4. Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, we're baptized into his death, we are identified right there. The moment of our belief, we are identified with the death of Christ. So when we are identified with his death, what are we also identified with? His resurrection. Verse four, Romans six, verse four, therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That spirit baptism that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So that word there, baptize, it was drilled into me. That was a part of the salvation recipe 
And it's, it's funny because that's actually what they called it. It was like a recipe. And if your salvation was like a recipe, and if you were baking a cake and you were following it to the letter to bake that cake according to the recipe, if you left out something, it wouldn't give you the right cake. It wouldn't turn out the way it was supposed to turn out. So the way we were taught about water baptism was it was part of the recipe of salvation. And so if you left off water baptism, then the whole salvation experience was not salvation because water baptism was a part of the recipe and you could not leave it off. If you left it off and you walked out that door and dropped dead in the driveway, you went to hell. That is how much a part of the recipe of salvation it was ingrained in us. So, but that word baptize means to identify with, uh, not dunk in water. We see this in uh, 1 Corinthians 10 verse 2, which we covered, where Israel was all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Now the sea is a reference to the Red Sea. As we know, God had the Red Sea's waters part. Israel walked across the Red Sea on dry land. Therefore, Israel was identified with the dry baptism of the Red Sea. Were they wet when they got to the other side? No, they were not wet. They walked across on dry ground, and yet the word tells us they were baptized with that. So that means they were identified with, they did not get wet, they were dry. We know that Paul is referring to the dry baptism here by the Spirit, because Paul says that all are baptized into one body, even though Paul does not know if all the Corinthians were water baptized or not. Remember, way back in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 14 through 16, 1 Corinthians 1, verses 14 through 16, Paul says to the Corinthians, I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in mine own name. And I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other, but yet Paul tells us that all are baptized in chapter 12, verse 13, into one body. So he couldn't tell you if they were all water baptized or not, because that wasn't part of what Christ sent him to do. But he could tell you that they were all baptized into one body. First Corinthians 12, verse 13. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have uh, been all made to drink into one spirit. So while chapter one makes it very evidently clear that water baptism, Paul didn't want to water baptize. Christ didn't send him to water baptize. But yet here he says, we are all baptized into one spirit. By one spirit, we're baptized into one body. By one spirit. So Paul doesn't know if all the Corinthians were water baptized or not. But those who believe he can assuredly say, just like you and I can, that they are all baptized by one spirit into one body. And we can also see that the spirit baptism of Romans 6, and six uh, 3 and 4 is a dry baptism by looking at Colossians 2, verses 11 and 12. Colossians 2, verses 11 and 12 says this, In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. After that scripture, there is a colon. So what I'm fixing to say, which is the next scripture, that was Colossians 2.11. So Colossians 2.12 is fixing to expound on what that circumcision made without hands is. Verse 12, Colossians 2, verse 12, buried with him in baptism, 
wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. No water there. That circumcision made without hands is equated to being buried with him in baptism. It's a spiritual exercise. It is a spiritual excision, if you will, of the foreskin of your heart. It's a spiritual surgery performed by the spirit. So those verses say that ye are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. So obviously that's referring to a spiritual circumcision. Though verses go on to say that we are buried with him in baptism. And this statement defines what I just said, uh, the circumcision of Christ. And since circumcision and baptism are linked as one event here, we can also know that the spiritual circumcision uh, is, in, is in view. Then we know that spiritual baptism is also in view. So why is it, my question to you to ponder today, is why is it that we have no problem understanding the circumcision made without hands? But yet churchianity does have a problem when it comes to water baptism versus spirit baptism. They don't want to apply the baptism spiritually. They want the physical, um, the physical thing rather than the spiritual when it comes to baptism. But circumcision, we have no problem. Um, this one view, then we know, is spiritual baptism. This one view, baptism, is, is in Ephesians 4, 5, must be spirit baptism, the one baptism. Ephesians 4, 5 says there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. The water baptism does nothing but get you wet. It's the spiritual baptism that then circumcises your heart, that identifies you with the death of Jesus Christ, that we can also be identified in his life, in the resurrection. So Colossians 2.17 talks about the things of Israel being a shadow. This was another important part of things to come. The, but the body is of Christ. So Colossians 2, and I'm going to add 16 and 17 there for context. Verses 16 and 17 in Colossians 2 say this, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. So the things that are a shadow, those things that are described there in Colossians 2, 16, are the things of Israel. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or the new moon or of the Sabbath days. Those are the things that are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. So therefore the shadow, water baptism was a shadow of spirit baptism. The shadow of water baptism is replaced by the body of spirit baptism. As such, the water baptism by the Mormons or anybody else, Paul wasn't obviously addressing Mormons here. Paul was addressing some people who were being, being baptized for the dead. It wasn't the Mormons. So that's who we know in today's society. But Paul was addressing that very thing there. But when we look at that act, that baptism for someone who is dead is meaningless. You can't, you, what did Paul tell us? I could wish that I myself be accursed for the sake of my brethren. Who are his brethren? Israel, the Jews, that the Jews were his brethren. He says, I could wish meaning he couldn't do that for them. They have to believe on their own. We can't be spiritually baptized for anybody. Water baptism doesn't even count uh, because there's one baptism, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And we've crossed over into this wonderful, amazing, exciting dispensation of grace so that we know that it is all spiritual, not physical.
So even if you do not recognize spirit baptism, and, and there are places who only recognize spirit baptism with what they would consider evidence of it. And so today it would be, you've only been baptized with the Holy Spirit if you have evidence of speaking in tongues, for example. So there are people that don't even think you have been baptized with the Holy Spirit without that evidence. So even if you don't recognize that, spirit baptism, Mormon baptism for the dead must be meaningless because the only way you can get into heaven is by making the free will decision to believe the gospel. No one can force you into heaven after you are dead by being water baptized for you. Romans 3.22 says that we receive the righteousness of God by faith of Jesus Christ, by believing the gospel. The righteousness of God is only upon all them that believe. Therefore, even if water baptism had saving power today, it could not save dead people. A dead person cannot make the free will decision to believe the gospel. So unfortunately, there's nothing that we can do, physically speaking, ever, but especially not for someone who is dead already. A dead man can't make a decision. And we have to decide by our own free will to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. So another possible meaning of this scripture here, verse 29, else what shall they do uh, which are baptized for the dead if the dead rise not at all? Why are they baptized for the dead? Another possible meaning of that is that Paul is referring to a pagan religion that baptizes for the dead. And we talked about that in even in the modern uh, Mormon. Uh, the reason that is possible is because he says, what shall they do, which are baptized for the dead? I told you that we needed to pay attention to terminology, to pronouns and, and the way this is written. What shall they do, uh, which are baptized for the dead? Then the subject is changed to we, when we get down to verse 30, let's read verse 30. So verse 29, um, I'm going to read both of them, 29 and 30. Else what shall they do, which are baptized for the dead, if the dead rise not at all? Why are they then baptized for the dead? And why stand we in jeopardy every hour? So Paul makes a contrast there between they and we. So the subject there to, in verse 30 is changed to we, not they. So therefore, you could make the argument that Paul is saying that resurrection is true because some pagan religion baptizes for the dead. However, this argument does not make sense because you do not prove a truth by going to a false religion. I share this um, with you because it's, it's very good information here. Um, he says, for example, I would not say that the resurrection is true because the Mormons baptized for the dead. Because someone does that does not prove the resurrection. Remember Paul's purpose for this chapter, to prove the resurrection. Paul would not be saying that either. He would not be going to a pagan false religion to prove a truth, um, especially in light of the fact that he says in verse 33, that evil communications, and we'll get there, I hope to, to really pretty much close with that scripture today, evil communications corrupt good manners. Paul would not use the evil communication of a pagan false religion or doctrine to communicate a truth because paganism corrupts good manners. He would never do that, even if the pagans have good doctrine mixed with all their bad doctrine. I can tell you the church I grew up in, yes, did they give us the recipe for salvation? And was water baptism included in that? Yes, it was, which is a bad doctrine. It puts people in bondage to basically to the law. And we don't live under the law today. We live under grace. But there were lots of things that I could say was mixed in that is part of good doctrine today. For me to to tell you that I recognized that I was a sinner, that was absolute. Yes, I recognized that I was a sinner. Did I know that Jesus Christ was the son of God? Yes, I did. Did I know that he was? He died, that he was buried, and that he rose again for the 
what we considered the remission of our sins. That's the word that they used. Yes, I, I knew that. So there was some truth mixed in with that bad doctrine, but Paul isn't doing that. He's not going to mix bad doctrine to prove what is good doctrine. He's going to tell you what is the truth. So because evil communication corrupts good manners. So even a <laughs> Eric puts this here. And when I read this the first time, I had to chuckle about it because he says, after all, even a blind squirrel finds a nut every once in a while. And I had to chuckle at that. We see paganism attempting to corrupt good manners. We see that today on every street corner, but we see that in the word of God in Acts 16, verses 16 through 18, where Paul casts out the devil from a woman who was saying that Paul was a servant of the most high God, um, showing people the way of salvation. The devil's statement was true, but Paul cast the devil out so that it would not communicate false doctrine to the people. When you turn back to Acts 16, verses 16 through 18, and refresh your memory on that event, it says this, Acts 16, 16 through 18, and it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, uh, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. So when she said that, that was a truth that she shared, but yet she shared it also being possessed with a spirit of divination. Verse 18 there says, And this did she many days, but Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. Paul, even though she shared a truth, still in the time of the operation of that spiritual gift, used it to get the spirit of divination out of her. She shared a truth, even being possessed. But it wasn't the way we, evil communication corrupts good manners. And a lot to that story goes on, but we're going to stop right there. Paul cast out that devil from the woman, even though she said a truth. And what Eric says here that he believes this verse is really saying is that the Corinthians who were water baptized were baptized for the dead, spiritually speaking. Because Paul early on told them, I am not sent. Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. We have already seen that water baptism is not for today. Yet Paul says that he baptized Crispus, Gaius, and some of the other Corinthian, uh, others in the Corinthian church. Why? Because the Corinthian church was joined hard to the Jewish synagogue. Crispus was the chief ruler of the synagogue. What, when he believed the gospel of grace, Potter, uh, Pete, excuse me, Paul, water baptized him. Why? Why did he do that? So as to be able to preach the gospel to those in the Jewish synagogue next door. The Jews would have known that John, Jesus, the disciples, and all others of the believing remnant of Israel were water baptized uh, in order to be saved in Israel's program. If Crispus, remember who he is, he is the leader of the Jewish synagogue, if or the ruler in the synagogue, the chief ruler. If Crispus was not water baptized, he may have appeared to be a hypocrite to those in the Jewish synagogue, and they would not have believed the gospel in order to be saved. Paul didn't water baptize him because it was part of the recipe of salvation. Potter, uh, why do I keep saying that? Paul water baptized him so that he would have an ear that the others would hear, that the others might listen. If he refused that, standing on his, his principle or the doctrine, they would have shut the door in his face. So Paul water baptized Crispus. 
Paul says, unto the Jews, I became as a Jew that I might gain the Jews. Physical circumcision is not for today. Yet Paul had Timothy physically circumcised. Why? The same reason, so that the Jews may be saved. The Nazarite vow was a sanctification ceremony specifically for Israel's program. Yet Paul took the Nazarite vow in order to have an audience to present the gospel to unbelieving Jews. Certainly then water baptism was a ceremony that believers who came from the Jewish synagogue should undertake in order for some Jews who are right next door to be saved. When we think about that concept, it sets, to me, it sets in order sometimes some of the things that we do, some of the things that we say. And while we want to stand on truth, always on truth, we, and, and we can, we have to sometimes gently bring those people into that truth when they are so steeped into the falsehood of their religion. If I walked into that Mormon museum and I started just denouncing everything that, that I saw, nobody would listen to me. As a matter of fact, they'd probably handcuff me and take me out in Salt Lake City, Utah, because that is the rule. So, I mean, even when you drive through and then we've been to Salt Lake twice. Once was back in 2002 when I, that I told you about. And another time was when we went on a, on a trip with another couple, a tour and our, our tour that was part of the tour. And what I noticed the second time going was different than the first. We didn't go to the museum, but we did get to go to the compound, uh, other places in that compound. And what I noticed, even on the street signs, was very much symbolism of the rule and the reign of the Mormon church in Salt Lake City. If you're not a Mormon in Salt Lake, you are definitely an outsider and you are definitely an outcast. When they can put that symbolism and that... Um, everything on their street signs. It's it's pretty amazing. But in order for me to have an ear, I might have to be a little more tolerant of what's going on that I can bring the truth to somebody rather than browbeat them with it and push them further into the pagan religion. Paul says that they were baptized for the dead because all unbelievers are dead in trespasses and sins. Ephesians 2, 1 tells us that. So when verse 29 here refers to being baptized for people who are spiritually dead, not for people who are physically dead. Since the Corinthians were carnal, that is about all that some of them did so that others might be saved. So their mindset was totally different. And remembering that, that Paul is talking to saints, he's talking to those who are saved but he's talking to those who are still so rooted in the flesh. By contrast, Paul stands in jeopardy every hour. Isn't that what we read in verse 30? Back to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 30. And why stand we? He's speaking of himself and those with him. Why stand we in jeopardy every hour? So Paul is listing works that are done in Christ when he says um, later on that he fought with beasts at Ephesus. Now, there's some, some school of thought on what that beast is and what those beasts are. But in other words, Paul is listing works that are done in Christ that prove there is a resurrection. The work of some Corinthians was to be water baptized so that some Jews may be saved. Since these Jews are spiritually dead, then the Corinthians were baptized for the dead. They were baptized for those who were spiritually dead. And that is possibly the address there that Paul is giving in verse 29. So only some of the Corinthians were water baptized. This is why Paul uses the word they. What, uh, why are they then baptized for the dead? What else, what shall they do? That's why he uses that. The Corinthians who had been water baptized instead of you.
they were baptized for those who were spiritually dead. It didn't, it didn't do anything. And it certainly doesn't do it if they're physically dead. So Paul's point then is that why did some of the Corinthians get water baptized in order to save some Jews if there is no resurrection? So he's saying, why bother? You know, previously he says, but if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then our preaching vain and your faith is also vain. And then he says later on where we're at today, why are they baptized for the dead? If you don't believe in the resurrection, why are you doing that? What is the point? Why even bother? So that brings us to verse 30 and why we stand and why stand we in jeopardy every hour? The interpretation that we give to verse 29, baptized for the dead, means that some of the Corinthians were water baptized so that they may reach unbelieving Jews with the gospel makes sense in light of what Paul says here in verse 30. Paul says that we stand in jeopardy every hour. And the we that he's talking about probably refers to Paul and those with him, such as Sosthenes and Silas. Remember in verse, uh, the very beginning of 1 Corinthians? Let me see, I think he tells us there. Paul, 1 Corinthians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother. So when he says, why stand we in jeopardy? He's talking about those that are with him. They stand in jeopardy because all religious people are against them. For example, around the time that Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, Gaius and Aristarchus uh, were in trouble in Ephesus and Paul left the city lest he be killed. Uh, since the city cried out for two hours, great is Diana of the Ephesians. They were not interested in what Paul had to say. They were interested in their pagan religion. They were interested in what fed a different part of, of, of them. We rely on the Bible as our final authority. Why? Because it nourishes and feeds our, our soul, our spirit. They were crying out, great is Diana of the Ephesians. And later, the Jews will try to kill Paul in Jerusalem for going against the Jewish religion. There is big money in religion. And we know this. We know this here in my town, not so much big money because we're a small rural community that doesn't have a lot of money. So, you know, you drive on our streets kind of zigzagging in and out of, of, um, of potholes and things like that because there's not big money here. But in religion, there is big money when you tell the people what they want to hear. Paul's preaching of grace and the free gift of eternal life then is hurting the religious business. Remember 1 Corinthians 4, 15, where they were listening to the 10,000 instructors they had in Christ? That was They were feeding upon that health and wealth gospel, which is what we see today in so many so many places. Paul wasn't preaching that. So it was hurting the religious business, whether it be a Gentile religion or a Jewish religion. And Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, this is interesting to me too, around and when you put the timeline of where Paul's writings fall in the book of Acts, he wrote 1 Corinthians around Acts 19. He wrote Romans and 2 Corinthians around Acts 20. So 1 Corinthians was actually written before Romans. Um, and in Romans 15, 19, Paul said that he had preached the gospel of Christ from Jerusalem to Illyricum. That was about half the world. That's hard for us to con uh, have that concept as well. He would later get to Spain where he would cover the other half of the world. In covering the first half of the world, Paul mentions in 2 Corinthians 11, 23 through 27, he gives you his resume, so to speak. He mentions many of the things that he had suffered, including being beaten with stripes five times. 
three times by rods, once stoned and left for dead and being shipwrecked once. He says that he received these things of the Jews. The Jews did these things to him. The problem was that the Jewish religion hated Paul, just like churchianity today. And this is a bold statement. Churchianity today hates Bible believers, those who make the Bible their final authority. Why? Because it hurts the business of the church. If you don't think the local church on the corner is a business and it is operated as a business with checks and balances and, and money, you are sadly mistaken because it is. And, and rightly divided Bible believers don't fall into that category because we do not preach health and wealth. We preach and teach spiritual not physical. So that's what Paul was bringing in. He was bringing in grace and he was bringing in that which, what, we are to, to rejoice in our sufferings? That's what Paul was bringing in, going totally against what the religion was teaching. So, and the reason that, that churchianity and that the Jews hated Paul is because he was exposing the religion of the Jews, that it was contrary to God's word. And Paul was leading people to believe God and his word rather than believing religion. Now, I can see that when I made that statement, there might've been some eyebrows raised. There might've been some thoughts that like, oh, that's a bold statement. And it is a bold statement. And when you hear that statement from a place not understanding, then you're automatically gonna think that that's a heresy. You're going to automatically think, oh, I'm not going to listen to that anymore because that is false. But it is absolutely not false. This is exactly why churchianity hates Bible believers. It threatens, I wrote myself this note because I, I wanted to make sure that I said this, it threatens the cash cow. You know, many, many churches, it is a cash cow. It is a cash cow for the pastor to live in a mansion, to have multiple jets at his disposal, to do good things, but they are fleshly good, not spiritually good. You know, they can organize trips to Israel. They can organize the, the missions in whatever way they want, but it is the cash cow that gets disrupted when the Bible is used as the final authority because we realize the difference. And I put here, I hate to say that, but it is true. The God of the Bible does not match the little G God of this world, it does not match the little G God of churchianity that preaches health and wealth in a physical form. And I put here to see 1 Timothy 6, 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 10, 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 10 says this, but godliness with contentment is great gain for we brought nothing into this world and it is certain we can carry nothing out and having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced, pierced themselves through with many sorrows. That is what the Bible says. That's the word of God. That's not what the local church preaches. Some may. Some may touch on that, using it as a form of godliness. Paul stands in jeopardy. Why stand we in jeopardy every hour? He stands in jeopardy of being persecuted and even killed every time he proclaims the gospel. We don't suffer that here. We don't walk the streets that he walked. We don't face that today. Now, in certain places, 
that might become prevalent and may already be, um, especially where the gospel is an enemy. The gospel of Jesus Christ is an enemy in certain places. And people who proclaim it are beheaded. They are facing persecution. And Paul is, that's what he's talking about. Why stand we in jeopardy? If there is no resurrection, what are we doing? Why would he subject himself to potential punishment like this if there is no resurrection, since he is not getting any material benefit? Paul is not your modern pastor. Paul is not pastoring a church in a multi-million dollar facility. Paul is in the foothills. Paul is making tents to survive. Paul is, gave you his resume of uh, being being beaten with stripes five times, three times by rods, once stoned and left for dead, and being shipwrecked. He gives you that resume. Why would he do that if it was for nothing? He wouldn't. Neither would you or I. So he, why would he subject himself to potential punishment like this? Since he's not getting that material benefit from preaching the gospel and mystery doctrine. So in other words, why go through this persecution in every city? If you remember back when Jesus was commissioning Paul and he says, get thee out of here, basically go or they are going to seek to kill you. And he says, I'm going to send you far thence unto the Gentiles. Why would he, he went through that in every city. There, there was no reward to Paul in those places. Why would he continue to do that if there was no reward to come? Paul profited in the Jews' religion above many his equals in his own nations. Yet Paul had suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that he may win Christ. Why should Paul give up all his material possessions and his social life in exchange for having little money? There again, having to make tents just to survive and being a social outcast if there is no reward for him in the life to come. Now, I want to touch on this and we're going to close verse 31. He says, I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I die daily. Now, I'm not going to go into the expounding of that. I just want to close with that because I want us to understand Paul's purpose for this chapter to prove the resurrection because why there were some that said there is no resurrection of the dead he shows that spiritually or physically we can't make those decisions for others i can't make the spiritual decision for my neighbor next door or for the person on the street corner to follow christ i can't stand in the interim and make that decision. They have to believe that. When we were dead in our trespasses and sins, a dead man cannot make a decision, whether spiritually dead or physically dead. What we can do is pray for the spiritual eyes to be opened, that they may come into the knowledge of the gospel of Jesus Christ that they would believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. We can, we can make a difference and affect an outcome in that way and in that way only. If I could make somebody's decision, man, we wouldn't be living on the streets we're living today. If I could make somebody's decision, if you could make that decision and effect change across America, wow, what a thought. God didn't create it that way. He gave us the free will to make our own decision. And that is the only way we can be moved from Adam to Christ. And what Paul says when he gives us his own resume, I haven't been beaten. I haven't been, I haven't suffered stripes. I haven't been shipwrecked, but he has. And he has for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as we close today, thinking about that, that next scripture, I die daily. I die daily. Let's close with that as we have that on our thought. 
Father, we thank you so much for the word in, in 1 Corinthians. We thank you for the, for the word entirely. But Father, we thank you for where we've camped out today. We thank you, Father, that Paul did what was asked of him willingly. And he gave us this gospel, this mystery doctrine that we can read and believe it, that it can affect our lives every single day that we read and believe your word, Father, that it becomes our final authority and that the sound doctrine that is imparted there builds up in our inner man, that we can see with our spiritual eyes, that we can rely on the indwelling Holy Spirit to, to be our teacher. Father, I thank you that we live in the dispensation of the grace of God. I thank you, Father, for for the men and women who have set forth their life to, to read and believe so that they might teach others. I thank you for that, Father. And I thank you, Lord, for everyone that's present here today. For I know each and every one of them have believed the gospel. I know each and every one of them have that stamp on their passport to heaven because it is a, an assurance. It is a confident expectation of the hope in which we live, Father. I thank you for that, and I pray for each and every one of them as they go about their day today. Father, may they look upward to where our hope is. Father, set our affection on things above, not on things on the earth. We thank you for all things, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.